Okay, so girls, on the basis of our um, studies for the last couple of years, what do you make of the concept of God? Assuming you believe in God, you might not, but perhaps assuming you do, what do you make of that concept? And you might, in responding to this, think about the, the different religious traditions that we've been dealing with. Over to you. Well, I think that I'd make sense of a God as being something, an idea that overlaps in most religions. And I think that it can be seen as more of a spiritual or loving presence. It could be more atmospherical than we make of a physical God. And I think that's something that you can see in most traditions and most religions and, I, and philosophies also, is just that they have this overlapping concept that a God can be something different than a physical form. Mm. So to me, I think God exists in different ways in different religions, but the overlapping idea of God being the creator of love and having such love for his creations or her creations on earth is what he's all about. Well, I think that coming into SOR, I had a fixed idea on what a God was. And over the course of the two years, I've really broadened my horizon and now know that I've got a whole different perspective on what mm. a God is. He's everywhere, everything, all different religions. Mm. Yeah, all I really have to say is that, yeah, when I came into SOR, I just thought God was this physical being and now that, now that I've like explored like through the course, like I know that like it can be interpreted in many different ways. Like some religions might see it, him or her or it as like, a physical being that's high above or other people just like Keely said like it can be like in and around and like I feel like I draw my belief upon that like him being more atmospherical and metaphorical rather than actually physically there so. Girls um, some interesting thoughts there and look I, I think even though I'm always, always I'm one person with one view I think I, I subscribe to um, much of what you're saying and I think Brogan, you probably summed it up fairly clearly. What, what I'm wondering about though is um, when you say, and this could be to any one of you, when you say sort of drawing from the different religious traditions, can you give specific reasons? It's a tricky one I know, but can you give specific reasons for why you might see God as being, say, loving spirit? And I think we've pretty much agreed it's, we go with spirit rather than anything mm. physical. Um, can we link that to any specific religion or in some way to a number of religions? Can we sort of um, elucidate, expand on that idea a little bit? Well, I believe that we can look at different faiths and particularly um, people that don't have a faith, maybe agnostics and atheists who don't really, like, may not believe in this type of physical presence and that it could resonate with them a bit better the idea that there is a spiritual loving spirit or presence around everything in nature and in way of life and that is also seen in the buddhist tradition and hindu tradition of there being this kind of loving spiritual natural presence around everything and everyone and then the idea of seeing the abrahamic faiths and particularly christianity which has adopted this view of it being more of a metaphorical kind of sense of being less physical more spiritual um, while science probably claims that there is no evidence of God, people who are of religious views could say that they've had experiences with God that they can't really explain. And through this, um, I think people can have their own views of what God is and why he is actually here. Um, yeah. Okay, so again, some interesting points, girls. Um, I love the Buddhist angle on things that we're all, um, and through our religions, it's just like fingers pointing at the moon. You know, we don't actually see the moon. And I think we can perhaps read that, something into that when we consider the religions. I mean, again, it's an individual perspective, but I think we find something of God in, in all those great faiths. Um, I'm probably biased. I still think that, that so, I was still privileged Christianity for some reasons, but... Uh, I do see something powerfully that's of God in, in other faiths as well. Buddhism's an interesting one because technically speaking there's no God, although Siddhartha the Buddha really refused to answer the question rather than saying definitively that there is no God. So 
perhaps that leaves something open. And I often wonder that even if it's the Buddhist idea of nirvana has got something godlike about it, it certainly suggests a, a spiritual state or presence. And, uh, and, and I think that would perhaps get us some of the way there. The other one I want to pick up in, on is what Dodie was saying about experiences, because this is something we've talked about a fair bit, so we're probably changing tack a little bit. But I would suggest that one of the main reasons people um, are religious, particularly as they become adults, is, is that they have experiences of something greater. Uh, there are things that go on. It might be a, a moment of, of incredible light or a, a, just a feeling that comes over people. And this is across the religious traditions and this is across human experience and history and, and they get a sense of something more going on. And maybe that's what we're talking about when we're talking about God. Mm. Um, well, just to like respond to that, I thought of when you said about things like that are unexplainable and like personal experience. Um, like I feel as though like personally, like when there's like hardships, like even small things like just stress over school, or like even like if a family member gets sick or something, or like even on the biggest scale, like some people around the world are like going through hardships like all the time. And I feel as though that can really draw like someone to maybe a religion or like a pathway or like a pers perspective on like the world or God or beliefs or anything. And yeah, so like experience that, experiencing that um, hardship can like draw someone to a religion and like something they can believe in and something that's like hopeful almost like something that's a yeah. okay so tiff an interesting one so when we talk about the hopeful thing i wonder when we start talking about as we have been in classes self-actualization or human beings being fulfilled how that's achieved or how you see that being achieved. How, how can human beings be totally fulfilled? And you might look at the connection of religion with that, but some of the other things that we've been, been considering. How do you see that? How do we become fulfilled? How do we self-actualise, to use the Maslow line, as human beings, do you think? Um, I think when we think about self-actualising, like actualising, within ourselves, like inside. Um, I think we often think about like a physical, like a checklist like that we have to like complete or like a criteria that we have to meet. Like, oh, I must do this and I must do that. But I feel as though becoming self-actualized and drawing upon Maslow, um, I think as we like meet our bottom needs, it obviously like builds up and like when you meet the bottom needs, then you can move up to like something like belonging or something else, but I think the whole self actualized thing all revolves around love. And I feel like love's a really strong like component in self actualizing. Yeah. Yeah, the way I see it is similar to Tiff's view, but there's also this idea of like maybe a fundamental Christian view or mm. Muslim view of you having to have this faith in one God to achieve this idea of reaching a afterlife with a spiritual and or maybe physical God. But I think that in that you can even look at spiritual leaders like Gandhi and people like Nelson Mandela who more they were more spiritual and re, and they more reached their full potential I think through helping others and I believe that's that same theme of love and that there's this that idea of having to have basic needs food water all of these things before you can reach this spiritual dimension in your life but I believe that if you have so much to give for others and you have so much care for other people and passion to do good that generally that reach that allows you to reach your full potential and that creates people as influential and powerful and spiritual leaders like Gandhi and other people like that and just it's that kind of idea of love being present in all things that someone does to achieve their full potential and their mm -hmm. self-actualization yeah just adding to that I feel that the whole concept of self-actualization can really it closely links with Buddhism, I feel, because I feel to be a self-actualized person, you have to be really fulfilled with your life. And I feel like to do that, you have to sometimes detach yourself from the materialistic world. And mm. that is something that Buddhism closely teaches. So yeah. I feel that you need to do that to achieve a sense of self-actualization. 
On another perspective, I don't think to achieve a self-actualization you have to be religious. Mm -hmm. I think people can definitely find fulfillment through other ways, um, like themselves through the environment and how you can like, people can help others um, and have love like God has love, but just in a different way. But again, um, it could be argued that religion certainly does help achieve that. Okay, some great insights, girls. Feels as if we've got somewhere over the last couple of years, <laughs> which is great. Um, so just to tie that together a little bit, um, Tiff, you were talking about love and others expanded on that theme. And obviously we're talking about a selfless love, mm. agape love, love where it's not necessarily looking to be reciprocated, love that might be long-suffering. And of course this ties in with this idea of in Brogan, you were talking about effectively altruism, doing things for the benefit of others. And I think your connection with Gandhi's an interesting one, and given we've just been exploring that, but he's right across the religious traditions, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And yeah. he wasn't looking to, or so it would seem, achieve anything in any sort of afterlife. It was about trying to show love in this life. And don't you like that line? Mm -hmm. An eye for an eye yes, makes everybody, world. makes the whole world blind, yeah, which we came across. So uh, there's a lot in that. I think back to um, the book I've mentioned a few times too, and this probably ties in with Dodie's point. Um, you don't necessarily have to be religious, but um, Hugh Mackay, the Australian um, social psychologist, he talks about the fact that the happiest people in life in his research are those who are other-centred. They've moved away from thinking about themselves and they're thinking about other people. And that's how, that's how they get there. Yeah. Okay. So, girls, something that we've spent a little bit of time exploring this term and last term, last term probably more than this term, is the question of afterlife. Because um, when we explore the, the different religions, um, and even when we move beyond religion, a lot of people look for something after this life. So my question is, no agenda, it's a personal matter, isn't it? But I'm wondering how you see that particular question, that existential um, question that arises um, for all of us. Is there something past this life? And if there is, how do you see it? And how might our study of religions have perhaps given you some insight into what goes on, uh, what resonates with you? I believe that personally through SOR, I've been, I've I'd be more open to other type of religions, ideas about afterlife and perhaps a different spiritual dimension we enter past this life. And I think like there's just so many beautiful customs in so many religions such as Judaism and particularly Islam, which they face the graves towards Mecca. And I just thought that's such a strong spiritual connection towards that religion, even in death, even beyond this life. And I think the thing that I take away from all of it from every religion, no matter what it is, even Buddhism, which has more of that um, relaxed idea of nirvana, which isn't as clearly outlined as other religions, it's still this idea that there is a diff there is something beyond this life, and that I think that a loving God would be accepting of all individuals, no matter what circumstance. And I think that that's what that's what I've taken away from SOR, and this is what perspective I've come to find over the past two years is that I believe that there is something more to what we are and what this life is and in whatever dimension it is whatever wherever it's going to be it's going to be loving and accepting yeah I definitely find that um SOR has really made me debate for myself what the concept of afterlife is um it's made me search that little bit deeper into what it means I know that coming into SOR I was very sure on the concept of an afterlife and what I thought it would be like. Um, but I think the assignment that we did in Term 3 um, on afterlife really made me question what it was about. Um, but after doing a lot of research and thinking about it, I still do have the same beliefs that I started out with. Um, definitely that I think there is something more not the um, stereotypical, you know, heaven up above, hell down below, um, 
but definitely I think that our spirit and soul continues to live on. Mm. Yeah, well, when I first came into the course of SOR, I came in with a very like biased viewpoint, like preferably over Christianity and Catholicism. And I was just very like, at the end of your life, you'll either you'll be judged and you'll either be going to a happy place where your soul will be at peace or a place where you might be like punished or like just you have to sit there for a while like yeah and um but after going through the course I've learnt that there's so many other perspectives that can be taken into consideration and like the only way that I can like really relate to them is just by like taking this one common thread of that what you take away from this life is that a loving God will always want to have a relationship with you and like that relationship on earth is just being developed on earth that this small time that we have here it's just being developed and so once we die I feel like all the religions continue that relationship and God wants to still be part of a relationship with you like till whenever time ends so that's what I've taken from the course I think whether or not there's an afterlife is one of the biggest questions we are always asking throughout the years. Every human wants to know, is there an afterlife? Um, I personally would hate to believe that there's not one um, because life is just too short for there not to be something more. Um, I would take the outlook that there is some sort of life after death but not the way the religions suggest there is. Um, I think I have a couple of issues with the way um, Christianity claims there to be an afterlife, but um, I definitely think there is something more because I would just, you know, for my own reasons, I'd just hate to believe that this is the end when someone dies. Interesting thinking. Um... It's just with respect, just a little bit um, as these things can often be somewhat nebulous or vague. So I'm just wondering if anyone can be a little more specific in terms of what they think might go on, assuming there's something, as I think you all do, past this life. Uh, I think Tiff, you, I think you were talking about um, you know being connected with a loving, loving presence or a loving God. Um, but any more thoughts about exactly, not that we can really know for sure, but what's your thinking there? Um, so personally regarding the afterlife, I believe that on earth is just this small time that we just have with developing the relationship. It's like when you first like get a puppy or first like dive into a relationship, like it's this time of like this new concepts and you're just learning and you like from personal experiences and your personal values or beliefs towards that maybe a certain religion or it doesn't even have to be religious but I believe that the relationship that you have with this loving spirit or metaphorical spirit or God or it will continue on so when you die that's only your body just staying on this earth and then your soul will rise and go somewhere peaceful so not necessarily like heaven or hell or somewhere that it's not a permanent state. It's something that your soul will go there maybe in transition or just resting for the time being and then maybe reincarnation or it's hard to tell but I feel as though like I hold this hope for coming back, your soul will come back. Yeah. So girls, just a couple of thoughts and these are just, obviously it's my thinking and then I'm interested in your your reaction well, I always find it interesting that um, in the talk about Jesus and, and what um, is described in the New Testament as, as occurring with Jesus that, that the Greek suggests that it was a body animated by soul in this life and that later, later on it was a body animated by spirit and in fact that's Paul's language Paul talks about about um, resurrection, that the body goes from one animated by soul to one animated by spirit. So it is suggestive of some sort of transition, which probably appeals to most of us. And scientifically, it probably ties in with the idea that energy's got to go somewhere. Mm. And we, so many of us as human beings have a sense that, that we're more than just the material physical. It's, um, I've told you the story before about my son dealing with uh, 
a young loved one, a, a girl, and looking at um, her body and saying she wasn't there, which was suggestive that she was, in his thinking, clearly that she was somewhere else. She being, I guess, the soul, which maybe had gone through some sort of transition. So that's one thought. Another one I'll just ask you to consider and maybe respond to is, um, is what about the person who rejects the idea of God altogether, rejects the idea of what we've been talking about as a loving presence, perhaps drawing upon the, the Christian idea of imminence, which we might get through other religions as well, something that's all around, a loving presence. Um, what about the person who rejects God? Um, do they get there eventually? Um, is that what you think? I mean, I would suggest maybe that even post this life, after this life, that the, the people will be confronted with a loving presence. And maybe hell, if there is such a thing, is going through the pain of suddenly realising uh, perhaps some of the, the things that have gone on and all those times when that, that love, which is meant to be at the centre of our, our operations, uh, has, has been rejected. Mm -hmm. And that in due course, I would wonder or hope or even believe that most people would, when confronted with a loving God in due course, come on side with that loving God, that loving spiritual presence, and, and thus continue on. So, over to you. So, in terms of people that don't have that relationship with God, and atheists, and what their view on afterlife is, um, I feel as though they don't want to have hope for something that may not happen. We are not certain if there is an afterlife. Uh, so I feel like they have an insecurity about them that they don't want to have a hope for something that they've hoped for their whole life and it doesn't end up happening. I think that maybe their view might be they'd rather spend their time and energy doing something else. Um, so in terms of the second part of the question, if they would maybe connect with God in an afterlife, we don't know for sure if there is an afterlife. So I feel like that is a very hard thing to answer. I think that if there was definitely an afterlife, they could. Um, and yeah, I really agree. The whole concept of hell could just be a pain and suffering period where they've come to the realisation that there is a God and there is someone to love them. So yeah, that would be my view on atheists. In relation to Christianity and the idea of Judgment Day, I personally don't really like that idea that um, God is this super loving being and then when someone's soul goes up to um, reunite with God that they have to go through this process. I, I'm not too sure how I feel about it. So if there were, as an from an atheist point of view, there could be the idea that um, that you know there is if there. Okay, <clears throat> gonna have to edit this out, Mr. Powell. Let me think of that real quickly. So, from an atheist point of view, they just believe that when someone someone dies, there that it just ends, and the idea of a cemetery and where people can go and remember their loved ones. That's what they can do and, you know, the memory lives on without the idea of the person living on through ways such as a spirit. And for them, they don't really have an issue with that because, you know, the person is still um, living on in their minds and that's all that matters to them. I believe that all of atheists and people that just don't generally believe in a lot of faith and reject religion and people that are very unaccepting of it may struggle with the idea that they need some type of physical proof they need to they don't have the open like um, they more don't have the idea of understanding that spirituality can be explored in different ways and that it doesn't need to necessarily be a physical form or something that you could vi like visibly see and so i believe that i believe that the idea of imminence across the religions and the idea of there being this surrounding love um, may be hard for some atheists, particularly people who focus a lot on scientific reasoning, would 
struggle to understand that concept because there's this idea of reaching higher dimensions and like different states even within this life um i guess being trans uh more being changed into a different place into a different state the idea of reaching this peaceful point in time and connecting with something greater and if they're not open-minded to that they may not necessarily be able to ever experience that and i believe beyond this life that in this in this life we have now we may have the opportunity to be connected with a god that or a god or a spiritual being that's giving us his love and it's our job to be accepting of it or to accept it and move forward with that and people who don't experience in this life may may experience it in the next and may have that relationship with god so with the concept of a hell i believe that it's not really that idea of fire burning like physical punishment i believe it's this idea that's giving someone a state to start to connect with god and have that relationship with this presence that is loving and then maybe spend eternity with this kind of peacefulness yeah i do agree with um brogan with the idea of um how atheists don't always have an open mind i think some events happen in the world and they question if there was a god how did he let this happen and so I think people just are quick to judge in that point of view and like, no, there's no way there could be a God because World War II happened and he wouldn't let that happen if he existed. Mm -hmm. So I think atheists, um, a lot of the times, can have a closed mind on the ideas of how things happen. Um, just expanding on that, I think it would be really hard for an atheist or an agnostic to commit or invest hope into something that they can't physically find proof for or don't know anything about. but. I think personally and from a religious point of view, I think a loving God will accept others into, like if they want to be part of his realm and connect with him, then I think he would allow that, but who's to say? Um, just in re some thoughts that crossed my mind with what you were saying. I guess one thing we've got to be a little bit careful about, I think, um, and even though it was within the context of what we've been talking about previously, but I think we've got to acknowledge, I think, also that people who don't, who are vehemently against the idea of God, atheists or those who are unsure, if we go with agnostics who don't know really what to believe, um, that there are plenty of very loving atheists and agnostics, just like, sadly, there are plenty of people who, of religious faith who are very unloving. In fact, I would even suggest that people who act lovingly perhaps even rejecting the idea of God might actually be a lot closer to God than, than some people of religious faith. And uh, I suspect the, uh, to be, uh, become part of that loving presence to, uh, um, to join in God in, with God in relationship post this life might actually be easier for some of them in some ways. But I'd suggest in some ways that what we think or believe it's probably not the critical thing. It's, it's how we conduct ourselves as human beings uh, in relation to others and, and the environment and so on. And of course, we're all subject to our, our genetics and environmental influences, but I think these are probably the critical things because if we think it through, at the end of the day, I think most um, religion is, is uh, encouraging us to, to live and act and behave in, in certain ways to hopefully leave this world a better place than, than the way we found it. And hopefully it's not just sort of selfishly um, about trying to achieve some sort of state in the afterlife, because I, I, that always worries me a little bit if, if that's what the focus of religion is, it's all about getting a reward. I, I think that's, that's a trap as well. Another thing that came up was the whole um, question of, um, I think, the nature of God. Dodie, you made reference to pain and suffering there. I want to throw this one out there and you might think how you would respond. I would suggest that God is, is not a personal being but relates to us personally. So that goes with that idea of spirit. I would also suggest that God is not so much interventionist in nature but relational. God is about relationships. And so when we, we raise these questions about pain and suffering caused by human beings making poor decisions. Um, we've talked before about the fact God doesn't interfere with that because free choice is integral to the human condition. Um, 
and it would be less than human if God interfered. And I'm not sure that that's God's style anyway. And then the laws of nature, I would suggest, as determined by the laws of physics, do what they do. Yeah, they do what they do, and that God allows them to do that. And even where we find examples of healing that people refer to, whether they be religious or not, I'd suggest that's probably within the laws of nature, that there's always that very narrow um, chance or possibility that someone will get better. So God might be more relational, I think, than um, in interactional in, in his style, I'd suggest. And a final thing was that there's a whole question of biblical interpretation and the interpretation of religion in general. Dodie was talking about Judgment Day. Um, I'd struggle with that too. I don't see that as being consistent with a loving God, although some Christians have pointed to God's characteristic of holiness as well, that God is a God of justice and so on, as well as love. I personally, like you girls, one perspective would, would struggle with that. And so maybe we sometimes, or maybe people sometimes take scriptures too literally, uh, rather than um, seeing them as a, a, um, a lens through which we might glimpse God some people. Um, Midas Marcus Borg quoted a, a former Muslim student putting it, some people might in fact worship the lens rather than the, the God or the, the spiritual dimension to which it, it um, points. Um, and maybe um, when we look at sacred texts, these are records of people's experiences of God. And maybe we look at sacred texts across the traditions um, to see to find out about those experiences and where to look to have those ourselves rather than getting too, um, too uh, literal. Maybe some thoughts there, girls? I think if people take um, sacred texts like the Bible too literally, they could find themselves um, in some weird situations, you could say. Um, and they're just really hard to believe. So if someone took the Bible literally, they'd be like, right, I'm not going to be Christian anymore. It's just too hard to believe. So the idea of taking um, the stories in the Bible metaphorically is um, a really nice way to go because there's some really nice stories in there. My personal favourite would have to be um, from Samuel in chapter 7, I think it is, the story of David and Goliath. Um, some very strong messages from there and which I use in everyday life with overcoming my giants just like David did. And um, all throughout the Bible, there's just so many loving and caring messages, which are the core values which us and Hilda's girls carry out in everyday life, like um, love, compassion, forgiveness, hope and grace. Yeah, I believe that spiritual texts, sacred texts, are interpret interpreted differently in every religion, obviously. Things like Islam, where there's lots of controversy recently around how people are interpreting what it actually means and taking violent teachings and praising that they're that religion maybe don't represent the religion as the followers would like them to so I believe that there's obviously good and bad in every religion there's extremism there's pro there's progressive people there's fundamentalist conservative people there's just a whole range and that every person is able to take those I think those meanings and all of those values and apply them how they wish to. I don't believe that there's one certain way that everyone does everything because everyone would just be conformed in the same way. It would just be segregated little societies and that's how it creates individuality, I believe. And to take things from like, say, the Buddhist scriptures such as the Dhammapada. I read a book recently about the sayings in comparison to Christianity and I think that there's so many overlapping ideologies and like values within those religions which make it a very interesting a very interesting idea that they maybe they have this overlapping idea or this central point coming back to this that we all should live our lives with compassion and love and I think that's the biggest thing I take from any type of text I read is how is this what is this teaching me yeah so I know that you as a teacher have got um, a particular bias towards Christianity. How have you coped in not letting that kind of show with teaching all of the different religions? Love the question, Kira. Very insightful, very insightful. Um, I'll probably cope better now 
than I did, say, seven or eight years ago, to be frank. That's probably because I've done so much, uh, so much reading, probably 30, 40 books a year, I guess, on theology and religion because it's just become my, my area of interest. And, and through that, I've probably become a lot more progressive in my thinking. I was, it was always there to some extent. So to answer your question, it's easier now because I can really see the overlap in so many cases. And just like the book that um, Brogan referred to, which I, I passed on, the one where, you know, it's lining up the, the Buddhist sayings, particularly in the Dharmapada and, and, and those attributed to Jesus, um, I can really see the connections. There are certainly differences. And look, there's no doubt that my Christian bias is still there. And I always have to point that out because you, we've all got some background, whether it's religious or not. And so that does colour my thinking. Um, but I'm, yeah, probably far more progressive in my thinking. Even though I'd still say I privilege Christianity, I'd still call myself Christian, even though I'd probably go with the label of progressive. Um, I'm reading a book at the moment, um, which I can't put down, which is uh, written by a guy called Paul Nitter, who says, uh, "Without Buddha, um, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be Christian." And uh, looking at, at some links and, and some insights he's got through Buddhism that have uh, enabled him to, uh, without being too literal, see some Christian teaching in a much broader, clearer way. Hopefully that, that covers a sensational question, young lady. <laughs> I was just wondering, because you've influenced me so much about religions and like developed my passion for studying it, but I just want to know where you got your passion for it and your, yeah, awesome. Was that, we'll still have time, ask the question. Oh, okay, there okay. we go. I just want to know where you developed your passion for religions and studying and appreciating these faiths. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's a hard one to answer in a way. Um, in many ways, I think it was always there under the surface. Even as a child, I was sort of curious about those things. I mean, I still remember as a, you know, someone much younger than you girls getting just as part of a history class some stuff on Buddhism at school so many years ago now. And I just remember being fascinated by it. So it was probably always there. You know, but I think a lot of it's come about because it's probably through the pathway of being in the first instance, and as I remain, I guess, a committed Christian, and that has largely come about through experience and through searching and, and a feeling that there had to be more to it. And I guess through teaching SOR, I've, I've had to look more closely at other religions, so it's just developed past that um, from doing that. And uh, I almost can't keep the, the interest. It's an esoteric interest, I know, but I'm glad I've, I've helped pass it on to you too, Brogan. You'll, you'll take it into amazing places, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it's something I'm grateful for. And uh, thanks for your question.